Good afternoon. We are at the home of Bernie Gaudreau in Haverhill, Massachusetts. The date is June 16, 2004. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Haverhill Oral History Veterans Project. Good afternoon, Mr. Gaudreau. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for uh, participating in this project today. Oh, you're welcome. Why don't we start out uh, with just some uh, introductory questions, some pre-war questions. Uh, could you give us uh, your date of birth and where you were born? I was born right in Haverhill on May 31st, 1924. And I lived in the same house right up until the time I married. And then, then I, I moved to Bradford, which is part of Haverhill. And I still live in Bradford. I lived in the first house about six years, and then, then I bought a, this house here, which is a single family. The other one was a duplex. So I've been quite happy here. Now we're thinking about selling this house in a year from now, but we're beginning to fix it up like you probably noticed the new driveway out there and we just had a fan installed this morning in the kitchen so it would make it more attractive to anybody looking at the house. Sure. Uh, as far as my service goes, uh, I want to say right out that uh, the, the reason I enlisted, I, I felt uh, I had something to prove and I tried different things in life and, and I, in my own eyes, I had failed, and so I thought. In, know, in what I, way? In what way do you feel in your own eyes? Uh, well, uh, like like I I went to uh, a school uh, up in Passamaquoddy, Maine, that my father arranged for me to go to, and uh, what it was what it was it was during the time of NYA, National Youth Administration. And uh, a local politician could could recommend you you attending, and you could sign up for things like aircraft mechanics and get a trade out of it. And I had only two years of high school prior to that, and and that was another thing that I thought I had failed in the pursuit of education in high school, because I I felt like I was like a blotter. I couldn't absorb any more education, and and I quit after the second year of I. And I, I tried two or three more times and, and failed and quit again. So, and then, then when I went to this past McQuarrie Main School, I, I got homesick. After, after about two weeks there, I was shipped back on a train all by myself. And uh, so, uh, by and large, I felt pretty much of a failure. And I thought I had to prove something. So I, figured, I picked the airborne. I figured, well, that's a good rugged outfit. And if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. And that's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was a, a volunteer. The, it was a it was all volunteer. Yeah. And, and when we went in, uh, we, we went to Toccoa, Georgia, right from uh, Fort Devens. And I took my basic training as a parachute regiment in training. And we weren't assigned to a division until we got overseas in England which time we joined the 101st Airborne before they saw their first combat. Uh, but let's see now. Uh, help me a little bit. Where, where, yeah, where well, was I let's, at? Uh, let's back up just a little, uh, a little oh, bit. Okay. Uh, what, uh, you felt like you had something to prove. Was this right uh, after oh, Pearl Harbor it, had been bombed or had you joined no, prior to no, that? No, no, I think it was more for selfish reasons, more for just self-improvement and and I felt well this is something if I could do this I'll prove to myself I'm not a total failure. I'll be done. And yeah. was this, had you joined uh, prior to the war breaking out or had the war uh, broken oh, out? The or? war had broken out I because I joined one year after Pearl Harbor Day. Okay. I was in the special contingent. They saved their enlistments and they had about 40 of us leave Abel at the same time for on uh, December 7th 1940 which was one year after Pearl Harbor. No, 42. And Would have been 40, uh, Pearl Harbor was 41. Pearl, it was 42. 42 I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, any, anyhow, uh, as I said, I, I felt I was a failure beforehand, so I, I, it really was important to me to prove myself. And it turned out it, it was very good because after, I, after my service, which is jumping a little bit, but after my service, I came back home and I felt I could do anything and I joined Western Electric and I started at the lowest 
paying job, but I ended up as a supervisor. Oh, wonderful. And, and I, I, I felt I had my future in my own hands. And uh, I felt, you know, that it was a good decision going yeah. in the, the airport. Yeah. Because I got down to Camp Decoe, Georgia, and they gave us a rugged basic training. And those that washed out went to regular inventory. At one time, they used to court martial them if, if they if they uh, couldn't uh, jump out of a plane. But before we got to that stage, if they couldn't keep up with the physical training, they washed them out and sent them to regular infantry or, or anything they might be suited for out of the service. And uh, so, let's see now. I, I, I don't want to spoil my train of thought. Okay. Uh, so we went through the basic training, then we went to Fort Benning, Georgia for, for our parachute training. And that was about four weeks, and we got five parachute jumps in, which we packed our own parachutes for. And th this was to give us more confidence that they were going to open up. So uh, a lot of the reason I went into that prelude there and, and told you about why for self-improvement uh, reasons I wanted to join Airborne. Uh, well, the, the reason was that I felt it did help me tremendously in later life. And uh, I found the training very tough, but not too tough for me. And it's a funny thing, when I was a kid, uh, the doctor had come to our house said, he's got rheumatic fever, leaking valves of the heart, and he, I don't want him climbing any stairs more than necessary and he shouldn't engage in any sports. So I was relegated to becoming a bookworm very, rather fast. My father would come home from dinner and see me playing tag rush in the, in the neighborhood field, and he'd stop his car and get me in, get me home and read the book again. And so uh, it bore out that the doctor knew what he was doing, even though they didn't have the tests in those days. Like you got to remember, I was about uh, 10 years old, and uh, uh, let's see, I was about 10 years old, and uh, I forget what, what I was going to say, I guess. But any, any, anyway, uh, I became a bookworm, but when I joined Paratroops, I, I didn't tell them that I had any history of heart ailment. Otherwise, they never would have taken me, I thought, even in the service. W were you concerned about that, knowing how vigorous and, and tough the training was? Uh, were no, you concerned about no, your I health at all? No, I wasn't concerned because I thought I, the doctor had, had said that I might outgrow it, and I felt that, that I had outgrown it, uh, whatever the, the problem was. And I guess it was true because I kept up with the very tough physical training in airborne basic training. They used to have us get in full field equipment and, and run up the side of a mountain and down that, again. That's yeah. part of our basic training. Do you remember the name of that mountain? I, I, yeah, it was Mount Tacoa. That's right. And it that's was in Tacoa, Georgia. And uh, the whole regiment did it. And then we lost some people on, on the runs. Yeah. And I can remember the lieutenant going to one that was down and turning him over with the toe of his shoe to make sure he wasn't faking. And uh, then he'd, he'd be shipped out, but but it was tough, and uh, but uh, but I felt pride in it. I was doing it. Uh, so then then uh, then we, I, I I stayed on after my parachute training. I stayed on at Fort Benning because I I was going into a specialty, and my specialty was radio operator. Were, now, were you given that choice, or were you told was, you would be? I was given that choice. Okay. Okay. And, and but it was based on on uh, entrance exams mm -hmm. that I had taken, and I I showed I was adaptable to mm -hmm. learning the Morse code and so forth. But the, it turned out the radio operator, the the radio that I was going to operate was only a platoon radio, and it was a walkie-talkie type. We parachuted down with it strapped to our leg, and and then then we were in in touch with our company commander. And, and for the platoon uh, business. So every, everything worked according to the way, the way it was supposed to. And uh, 
I, I, did, I stayed for four weeks, then I rejoined my regiment at Camp McCall, North Carolina. And uh, that's where they were taking further training until we were told in late 43. See, I enlisted in 42, and we were told in late 43 we were going overseas, and chances are we'd be attacking uh, the Germans to, to, to uh, change the course of the war. And uh, so after we got overseas, I can remember running and the roads had thatched roofs on the houses. And uh, we'd run by and we'd be counting cadence, one thing or another, as a, as a unit. And uh, I often wondered what those people must have thought, <laughs> you know. And uh, any, anyway, uh, let's see, we, we uh, to get on to D-Day, uh, we were assigned to the 101st Airborne Division before we even thought about going over to Europe. And uh, the closest I'd come to the war at that point was buzz bombs were traveling over our heads when we were in our mess kit line in the morning and they were heading for London. This was in England, okay, uh-huh. Uh, they were heading for London and a uh, buzz bomb, for, for those of you that might not know it, it, it makes a noise like boom. Boom, and you never know where it's going to come down, except when it runs out of fuel, it comes down at that point. So the Germans had programmed them to have enough fuel to get to London and take out a certain area. How far out of London were you? Do you remember? Roughly? We were about 35 miles. We were in a little town called Newbury in Berkshire County. And, and, and we, we went to an air, air, airport near there when we uh, jumped overseas. And uh, well, that just about brings me up to the time that we did jump overseas. And, can, and can I back up real quick before we sure. continue? I, I, I don't want to ruin your train of thought, but I just, and I, yeah. just to get a better general idea of, uh, of uh, prior to that, uh, you know, you went into the airborne uh, to jump out of airplanes. Had you even ever been in an airplane prior to that? No, I'd never been in. And I, and, and what was it like to jump out of a, a plane for the first time? Well, I tell you, the first few times it was exciting, like going on an amusement ride that was beyond your ability to take. And uh, but after that, you became a little bit uh, nervous about the jumps because you saw that, in spite of your training, you still could get hurt. You can oscillate underneath your chute as you're coming down and have the wind just take you up and put you down on your back on the ground and you could land on a rock. And I saw what good people were getting hurt and well-trained people were getting hurt. So that made me a little bit leery uh, about, about this parachute jumping. But I, I, I stuck with it and I got 18 jumps and approximately before I went over to, uh, to France. And, and that was, we made two combat jumps. The first one was Normandy, and uh, we went in. First of all, let me say, going going over the English Channel, it was like looking down and seeing all the ships. It was almost like from shore to shore you could walk on board the ships. There were oh, so was, many. Must have been an impressive sight. It yeah. was. It was very impressive, and uh, I've heard it described as the biggest armada of, of men and material and ships that, that was ever assimilated for one endeavor of any war, and probably would be the biggest one in the future, too, because we went to the atomic bomb, as you know, yeah. and that eliminated the need for heavy engagement, uh, invasion forces. So anyway, anyway uh, we, we, par we, we implained about say quarter to ten, a little before ten o'clock in the evening. And then we flew around uh, out over the English Channel and for formed up so we were uh, in the formation that they wanted. And how uh, prior, uh, upon taking off, how, how much sooner before then had you got your orders and knew exactly what, what was going to happen, where you were going? What? Uh... Well, while we were at the airport, we, we were at the airport two or three days and they had sand tables laid out and they showed us the topography of the area that we were going to jump in and where we were, were uh, committed to 
stopping the Germans from reinforcing down on the invasion beaches. And we were, we were going to jump about four or five miles inland. And the way it worked out, we did. And, and uh, when we first landed, a lot of the sh planes were detoured off, the, off their plan. And uh, we were dropped, uh, mixed up with, with other regiments from our division. Nobody in the stick I was in was was in the same field I was. It was quite a mix-up. And uh, can you tell me a little bit about what uh, what your feelings were were like uh, on the on the plane ride over and what your fellow soldiers well, were? What you well, the plane ride over first, I was awestruck at, at the number of ships underneath uh, on the ocean going over, and I felt I felt good about it because I felt. Well, they're putting a lot of effort into this, and so I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to have a good outcome. And uh, let's see now. Uh, well, any, anyway, if I can continue on. Okay, sure, certainly. Yeah, we we uh, we par parachuted down, and there was nobody around in the field I landed in. And, and but I, I met five or six people, but none of them were from my regiment. As soon as I went to the edge of the field, which was encompassed by hedgerows, mm -hmm. and a hedgerow is, as I can describe it, is, is a built-up area with trees uh, on the circumference instead of the rock formations that you see in New England. It was trees, and it was an obstacle even tanks couldn't get through too well. They, t they tell me that some of our tank men, uh, not necessarily airborne tanks, but uh, regular tanks, they, they found when they got to the Hedgerow country that they, if they put a pair of like uh, steel arms like forklift trucks, they could take out the, mm -hmm. these trees a lot better than if they just tried to run over them, they'd get with their belly showing and, and they'd be more vulnerable. The weakest part of the tank is the belly, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we had these little clickers uh, for a password. We were supposed to click them once, and of course you you press it, you got to release it, so it ends up with two clicks. And uh, the the uh, party that you're checking for him to acknowledge the password, he has to give you two clicks back. And uh, we used that. Uh, I understand some some airborne didn't. I heard that after that they they didn't use them because they felt the Germans were wise to them. But I think it was a good good password. And uh, I I, rem I remember when there were five or six of us joined, all from different regiments. Uh, we joined together. And if there was an officer or a non-com, he became the leader of the group. And uh, I, I can remember some some uh, men running down the road opposite a hedgerow, and they were definitely Germans. They were running in formation, and you could hear their boots strike the earth. And we didn't let we didn't give them the two clicks at all because we didn't want to reveal our, our position to them, and uh, we were just glad they ran on by. <laughs> so th then we we. We, we went in about four hours before the seaborne troops went in, and uh, about four hours after we started collecting the six, well, I got back with my regiment again, and we started in one of the towns that, uh, that was on our list for, for uh, cleansing it of the German, so to speak, and uh, we, we found that, uh, oh, let's see now. I'm sorry for this lapse that's, I have. That's fine, no problem. Yeah. Any, any, anyway, uh, I got wounded in this first town, and, and we, we'd gone down one side of the village, it was a little country town, and there was uh, homes, and then there was, right across the way was the barn and so forth. And we'd, 
gone down the end of one street and towards the center was fields and I think the Germans were there and uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we were starting back from the end of the street and I got shot through the left arm with an explosive bullet which was outlawed by Geneva Convention rules, but somebody had used their spare time to file the, the tip of a, a bullet. I have the bullet here and two pieces of shrapnel that I get hit with later in Holland, and I'd like to show them to you. I'll Certainly. Remind me, I'll have my wife get them out mm -hmm. for you. Uh, they, they were in the picture that, that you read on mm -hmm. page three. Or the palm, I was holding them in the palm of my hand. They took a picture of the, the, the hardware that I get hit with. So anyway, what did that feel like? Was it? Uh, I mean, what's well, it feel like it, to be it, shot? It, it, it felt like somebody had, had hit me with the side of the shovel and knocked me down. But but uh, there wasn't a whole lot of pain because the shock of being hit and wounded uh, and the co compensates sure. for the pain somehow. Yeah. I don't know what the answer, what the explanation is, but I I've always heard that sometimes when a fellow has a grievous wound. He doesn't feel as much pain as you'd think he would, because because of the certain amount of shock that sets sure. in, yeah. and and kind of takes care of uh, the pain. Uh, so anyway, we uh, oh I I motioned like this where I thought the shots were coming from because after I fell there was a wall uh, on one side of me and, and they put two more shots near my head and it spat it against the wall. So I, I motioned like this to the two fellows I was with in the direction the shots were coming from and, and they stuck their rifles around the corner and just fired at random in that direction. And when they did, I got up and I ran to the cover of the nearest barn that the, the two, two fellows had, had fallen behind. So then we went up the street and we, at the head of the company street, uh, the, head of the town, Main Street, where, where we had set up company headquarters, it was kind of like behind the hedgerow. Uh, that's where the wounded was being taken, and, and as well as German wounded that, that were taken, and we, we waited for uh, seaborne troops to come up to us to take us back to England. And uh, the first one I saw, incidentally, was a black man. He was driving the truck that come up to take us back. And at that time, the blacks were relegated to right. mostly driving jobs and things like that. Segregated from the rest they, of the Army, weren't they? They, they weren't in yeah. combat yeah. units. Yeah. But uh, I appreciated what this film did, yeah. even though he only drove a truck yeah. and, yeah. and took me back. And one odd thing, when, when I was in the truck, they put me aside of this young German soldier and uh, his, uh, his arm was hanging by shreds, and, and I, I, I went to hold his arm steady from the motion of the truck so he wouldn't be jostled too much. I thought it was a little bit incongruous because, uh, you know, a half hour earlier we were trying to kill each other, yeah, and I, yeah. now I'm trying to help him. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we became two human beings. Right. And both too young to be doing what we're doing exactly. because I, I had just turned 21 the week before I, I parachuted into Normandy and uh, and he, he was not even as old as myself. Uh, oh, another thing, when, when uh, I forgot to mention it, but when we were flying over looking for a drop so a lot of the planes were being shot down and, and I saw at least one go down close to us and I learned afterwards that the, the plane that I was supposed to have been on had moved at the last minute so I could be with my uh, lieutenant and be his communication, being the radio operator. Uh, the other plane went down with everybody on board and nobody got out alive. And I had been bunk mates with these people for all the time we were in England. So that was tough to take, tough. Le learning. I didn't know at the time that they were 
they were the ones shot down, but I learned after they, they were one of the planes that went down and nobody got out. So anyway, uh, uh, I went to, went to England and uh, they, they, they put us on board a ship and they put the Germans down in the belly of the ship or the hold of the ship and we were on an upper deck and uh, I heard one shot ring out. I figured after it must have been some German trying to act up or escape or something. But I never did find out what it was. I just assumed mm -hmm. I wouldn't be told anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, a after we, I went to England. They took out the, the the bullet, and and I I had a certain amount of time that I had to recuperate in the hospital. Then I was given a leave to go to. I I, I decided to go to Ireland, and uh, I went to Belfast, and. Uh, an interesting thing, which most people don't know, is the Southern Ireland was taboo for any Americans to go down there because, because uh, you couldn't go to Dublin, for instance, because they knew the Germans were refueling their submarines in, in Southern Ireland. Really? Oh. And, and that's not common knowledge. No. I don't know why it was held back, but uh, probably it would have raised too much hell telling the people about it at the time because every town you go in has a lot of Irish. Yeah. I'm half Irish myself yeah, yeah. And, and I would have resented maybe hearing that, but it was true. We couldn't go down there because of this uh, German usage to refuel the U-boats and the U-boats was flying on troop ships and everything right, right. exploded. So, uh, how long were you in, uh, in recovery? Uh, how long did it take you to recover from your wounds? I, it took me about uh, only about two months, and then then then, then I was about two weeks. Uh, see, no bones were hit. Fortunately, it was all flesh wounds. And what the bullet did was it trans it went right through my left arm up here. You can see the mm -hmm. it looks like a vaccination mark, yeah. uh -huh. but it exited the other side. Then it went into a backpack. I was and I was running at the time, and so it was about an inch away from my heart. And uh, it, when it went in my backpack, it turned around on a lighter fuel bottle, I think, that I had in there, because they took it right out from this armpit. So it re-entered my back to, at the gash that it made going, going through the arm. And to this day, I still have small pieces of metal in the, in the Back wound, mm -hmm. and and that, the, I went I went in this, I went uh, to to in the veterans hospital at West Roxbury to have it analyzed uh, a year or so after I was out of the service, and they told me that I went in there because I had uh, uh, scar a lot of scar tissue in the wound. And that was causing me discomfort when I take my bus home from from uh, work in Lawrence, and uh, they told me they couldn't remove all of it because they would have done more harm than, than good by trying to get all of it. They left very very small, maybe size of pepper, you know, okay. uh, pieces of metal in me, and to this day I can't have a certain type. Uh, MRIs, I guess you call them, mm -hmm. because uh, anybody with metal in their body can't go through the procedure. So, so that that has uh, been always been a factor in in uh, any medical mm -hmm. exams that I've ha had, and I've had a few because I had a uh, artery replacement, triple triple artery replacement in my chest, and uh, I remember they couldn't they couldn't do that. So uh, to get back to where I was at, uh, oh yeah, I went to Ireland, and uh, it was it was funny. We we got a couple of girls up there, and I must have been more than another American at the time, and uh, they they were talking about being in the St. Patrick's Day parade and, and having their rosary beads out, and uh, they they were kind of chastised for that. But we were walking in the frame with the rosary beads. So, uh, any, anyway, we, we, 
I, 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 I went through all that, and uh, I probably could have come home, but, but I, I wanted to, I was young, and I was young, and I wanted to uh, stay with my outfit that I trained with. And, uh, was it once again because you did you feel like you still had things to prove to yourself, or you were confident in yourself, or was it just no, the camaraderie no, just, to, just, just to be with camaraderie? Yeah. I think that that I had with the fellows in the group. I'd, I'd I'd been with them so long and everything, and I felt I wanted to see the war through with them, and I felt they would made good progress since uh, since I was hurt. But uh, were, were you able to keep in touch with them while you were hurt and find out what their progress and how they were doing? Well, and, uh, the only way I kept in touch was reading the Stars and Stripes. And uh, a little later on, I'll get to that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I went to Ireland on, on, on leave mm -hmm. for, for four or five days, and then I rejoined my outfit. Oh yeah, and I parachuted in the Normandy, regular, regular combat duty. Uh, but that's what I mean by being young enough that, that and resilient enough that they wanted the, my type to be in there. Yeah. And uh, we parachuted in the Normandy, and it was a 50-mile Allied corridor that we jumped up through Belgium. Normandy or, or Holland? Well, between France and, and Holland. Oh, okay. So okay. It was a 50-mile corridor that we, that the Canadian Airborne. Uh, English Airborne and so forth, uh, and anybody uh, that, that was trained, Free French Airborne, uh, we made a 50-mile corridor, and then, then uh, troops could move up the corridor and uh, go into Germany. And, and they made a, a movie out of that, A Bridge Too Far, and uh, the, I think the English had, had, had jumped at the far north end of it and they jumped the bridge too far. They were in this town, they were, they had a water that was keeping them from where they would have been safer. The water of a river, I think. Any, anyway, um, uh, in Holland I was, I was unfortunate enough to, I was fortunate enough to last uh, a couple of months, a couple of months before I was wounded. Uh, whereas Normandy, I was wounded the first day. Uh, this time I lasted about two months. Then we were in the in the farmhouse, and uh, I was with a lieutenant and a few other non-commissioned officers were there. And uh, an 88 millimeter mortar come right through the roof, and uh, it put the lieutenant on the, on out of commission, and as well as myself. I got the, that, and I had the right clavicle bone broken in my shoulder by another piece of shrapnel. And uh, they carried us each out on doors and put us on the jeep and get, get us to hospitals, uh, staying within the American lines. But uh, a, a funny coincidence uh, was uh, when, just prior to being wounded, the lieutenant had got us all together as best he could under combat conditions. And he says, look, he says, you people are looking pretty seedy. You've been here a couple of months and you've, you all got beards. And he says, I want you to shape up and look like soldiers and by tomorrow's inspection. And he says, the comical part was, he says, and you too, good girl, for morale purposes, because I didn't have any beard. I was, oh. I was too young. Yeah. But, but I accepted it. And, and I always thought it was funny afterwards, you know. <laughs> he says, you two good go for morale purposes. So anyway, uh, oh, one, one, after being wounded in Holland, I, we were close to, close to Belgium, and, and they, they put me in Liège, Belgium, in a hospital there to, um, as part of my evacuating to, the, to England. And uh, while I was there, it got hit by a buzz bomb. Which, which was very unusual for buzz bombs to hit in that area. But I could hear the people outside, and they, they evidently wore cobble, uh, wore shoes, wooden shoes on cobblestone up there. And this was Belgium, though. This was Liège, uh, not Holland. But uh, I could hear their feet running, and I could hear, hear them uh, 
I could hear this boom, 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 and then nothing. And you knew and the then, sound from then above. Then I heard people screaming and running for cover, so I knew it was coming down. You knew the sound from the pre from England from your previous experience, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I I couldn't get out of my bed. I wanted to get under my bed for cover, and and I was on about the fourth floor, and I I couldn't because I had an ace bandage around my uh, shoulders, uh, a figure eight bandage rather around my shoulders and, and my leg was in a cast even though it hadn't been operated on yet to keep me from moving it or, or it was well bandaged and uh, so all I could do was put the blankets over my face and, and say a few prayers and I'd be all right and uh, I, guess, I guess I said the right prayers because uh, all I got was little bits of glass in my ear. It blew out all the windows in the building and there was a door at the Put in my hospital bed, it was blown off the hinges right across my bed, and uh, the concussion did this, you know. So, first thing I knew, a nurse was coming through and she had a little blood running down, shaking. She was wondering if we were okay, taking a check on, as to who was hurt and who wasn't. And I, 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 all I had was little fragments of glass in my hair, so I, I was lucky again. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that was about it, and uh, after after that, uh, then I really could have gone home. But but again, I, I wanted to stay with my outfit because for a third time, huh? for a third time, because by then the Germans were on the run and we were fighting in Germany for a, for a change, and so it ended up my units were sent to Birch's Garden, which was the summer Hitler home, yeah. Hitler's summer home, and. Uh, it was kind of in Congress that, that they were sent there because the Eagle's Nest, it was called by, and, and my division was called the Screaming Eagle Division. So uh, I rejoined them in Austria. It wasn't right at Birch's Garden, but it was nearby Birch's Garden. And uh, I rejoined them there. And uh, again, I, I, w I wasn't put on limited duty, uh, even though I'd broken the shoulder and, and had the knee wound that were all fixed and I got, I still got the shrapnel from it. Uh, but I, I, I didn't want to go home in that fashion. Yeah. And, and I felt, well, if we're lucky, we might not be any more fighting because it looked like the Germans were really on the run by, by November of 45. I think it was, well, 44, I think it was, uh, when I was wounded. So, uh, so anyway, I, I rejoined them, and fortunately, uh, the war ended uh, in, I think it was May of 45. Uh, and uh, we were sent home by point accumulation, which had to do with how many months overseas you were, and so forth and so on as opposed to, I thought a division at a time would be sent home. But, would, but would some, of the, some of those division members had only been with us a month or so, and others like myself had been with them from the first combat that they saw. Would, would you get additional points for injury? Did, did that help I, at all? I don't or? know. I don't know if you did or not. Uh, but it may have figured into the figuring because I went home ahead of a lot of the people in my division and it was strictly based on my points. Mm -hmm. And I know the points primarily was by how many months you'd been overseas already. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, I was wearing three six-month hash marks, which indicated a year and a half overseas. So, oh, I still have my uh, Eisenhower jacket. I'd like it to show it to you after. It has my, all, all, all the uh, ribbons on it and so forth and the parachute wings. It's quite quite nice, nice thing. I'll ask my wife. Excuse me, can I ask her to get this for you? Well, actually, we'll, we'll finish the interview, and what I'd like to do then uh, after the interview I'll, I'll, is I'll, I'll take the camera. I'd I'll, like to see I'll, your shrapnel okay. and your and, and okay. possibly a portrait of yourself, <coughs> and, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll videotape oh, okay. all that. Yeah. Uh, like, like on the on the Eisenhower jacket, I got in one arm of it, and and I had an American flag on the screen door, and the girl took my picture. That's why you saw it with yes. the flag back on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, 
So that, that was about it of my service. Uh, what, uh, if you can remember, uh, from the, the group that you went over with, or trained with, to the group that you came home from the war with, how many were left uh, in your unit from... Well, uh, well actually, actually, I, I, I was segregated one of the early ones out because most of the fellows I trained with were even killed or, or wounded so badly they were sent home already. And uh, I, I would say I would say that they must have had better than 100% turnover uh, of, of people. There's very few, even my company commander, he was killed, and there's very few that uh, were, were living by that stage. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones. And, uh, there might have been a few non-coms, but yeah. they evidently didn't didn't have the points I had, because uh, I, I think I was one of the early ones sent out, sent home. Do well, you remember remember the day that you heard that uh, Germany had surrendered and what everybody was thinking, how you felt, and well, a sense of relief? Well, uh, it was around the middle of May, mm -hmm. I, I think, but uh, uh, what impressed me was there's a lot of people that thought that it was too bad that uh, Roosevelt had died about two or three weeks earlier. Oh, right. yeah. in Fran I was in France at the time, and and uh, they, they thought it was too bad because he, he had uh, been instrumental in most of the activity during the war, and then he he had to die just just before. Yeah. Of, uh, uh, he, in other words, he couldn't see the benefit of all of the act activities that he had made. Uh, or plans that he had made. He, he was the one that went to Yalta and different places for agreements with Stalin and, and Churchill and really got things going. In fact, uh, I can remember when before we parachuted into Normandy, he, finished, he visited the airport we were at and we were just hunkered down in groups waiting, waiting to be told to get in the plane. And uh, he, he was talking across the way. I could see him talking with some of the airborne troopers. And we were, we have so much equipment on us that for, for us to uh, get up from a sitting position, we had to have help from somebody else because because our rifle was across all our other equipment. Plus I had this radio on my leg. I had a combat knife on the other leg and I had bandoliers of, of uh, ammunition around my chest, and then I had not only my back parachute on, but a, 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 a reserve parachute up front uh, that I wore up front. And uh, I remember w being on the hot top, and I don't know if I get nervous or what, but uh, my parachute, uh, the, the reserve chute, that wasn't supposed to be used unless unless your uh, main one didn't open. It spilled out hmm. on me on, right on the hot top, and my lieutenant uh, said, "Here, take mine." And he made me take his, and he had no par no reserve parachute. But I, I later learned that a lot of the airborne troopers in the 82nd they they discarded their reserves anyway because there wouldn't be time for them to open. If the main one didn't, they did, they jumped at one, be something like that, and it was designed so their parachutes would just be open, break the descent of their fall, and they hit the ground and roll with it. And uh, so, so they they knew if if the reserve was needed, you wouldn't have time to get it out anyway. So, in fact. Uh, Americans evidently thought more of, the, of lives than, than the Germans because they 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 parachuted with only one parachute on them to begin with. They never used reserve chutes, mm. and so I, I think it was a case of dollars and cents. Wow, wow, wow! So, so the, the the war ended in, in May of '45. How much longer than before the war was over? Before you actually were shipped home? Do you remember? Uh, Oh yeah, actually, I got home around early December, and I went back to uh, uh, Camp Miles Standish, I think it was. It, it was a Massachusetts uh, camp down the Cape or something, and uh, I, I was discharged on December third, nineteen forty-five. 
So uh, it was it's six, uh, seven, seven months later. Yeah, actually, I was in in I went in December seventh, nineteen forty two, which was the year from Pearl Harbor date, and I come out December third, nineteen forty five. So it was just short of three years that I spent in the service. How many times in that three year period were you able to come actually come home? Had you been home? Uh, no, I hadn't. Been so home. basically, you've been away from I, home I for, think for one, three. Once I've been home, yeah. Once I've been home after basic training, I was allowed to go home. And then after I got my parachute wings, because I that's when I started smoking. <laughs> uh, I was on the train, I was bored to death, and I see different people lighting up, so I, I lit up. And then, then for the next 50 years, I've been buying cigarettes. Oh, will be there. But, but I gave it up back around 1940. Uh, let's see, I gave it up uh, uh, I don't know, about a year before I, I, I uh, retired, uh, I was 61, mm -hmm. I, I gave it up because I felt that if I wanted to get out in good health, I better quit smoking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's well, what I did. What was the feeling like, uh, you know, being away from home for three years in, in very tough conditions? To, to come home and uh, see your family, uh, say sleep in your own bed, uh, a well, nice home cooked meal from mom. What was, you remember that coming home the was, day you came was, home? It was a good feeling. It was a good feeling to be back with family again. And uh, I remember my father, when, when I went in the service, he thought I was gonna, going in the coast artillery. And he thought, well, that's good, he'll be safe. He'll be riding up and down the coast. And then he gets a letter from me and. My sister is reading it to him, and it says how I was undergoing airborne training. <laughs> so he said, what? <laughs> he was a little bit amazed at that. But, uh, he, oh, incidentally, uh, one thing that, that uh, helped me a little bit at times, we had, from our family, there was somebody in every branch of the service that, that was. We were like the Sullivans out in Boston there, mm -hmm. where they had them all in the same outfit, yeah. except we were spread out. I was an airborne, I had a brother that became a marine pilot, is at Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, then, then I had a, my oldest brother was in submarines. Mm. He, he was in Pearl Harbor as a home base. And uh, my sister, Eileen, uh, she was the second, about the second oldest in the family. She was a Navy nurse. So, and then, then I had my brother Russell and my stepbrother Kenny were in the Navy and Coast Guard. So every branch of the service had somebody in, in there. Uh, oh, I had another brother that was, uh, I, I didn't mention him, he was in the Army. But it, but it was more after the war than before. Okay, yeah. But he was still probably drafted at the time. Did, did your parents ever talk about uh, their feelings? I mean, having all of, all of you in the service, and particularly you, in, in very uh, in, in, well. In I know I know it bothered my father a lot because my youngest brother. See, we were a large family. We were seven boys and two girls that grew up. And then in addition, my father married again after my mother died, and uh, he he took on a widow that had three children, and then they had a baby since. So that's why. Uh, he he went down to the draft board, and when they were thinking of when my half brother was was going to be drafted, and and he appealed to them to have him home because he had so many in the service yeah. already. And and they uh, they saw the reasonableness of his request, and they they gave him a draft deferment. He never served. And he, he was, he was just glad, I guess, but he thought he was missing out on something. Mm. But, but they, it was a reasonable request for my father. Oh, oh certainly, yes. Because he was running a business, he, he ran a, he had a couple of barber shops, one in Havel, and then he had one down Hampton Beach, and there was three or four barbers working down there. My brother that was a marine pilot, he went through, he became a doctor after the war. Uh, he he uh, went to Tufts he, Medical, and he also went to BC four years, and he did it on the GI Bill. I never took advantage of the GI Bill, 
uh, I, but I did go back to Halo High and I, I got my equivalency certificate uh, from high school. But it wasn't under the GI Bill. It was something on my own while mm -hmm. I was working. Mm -hmm. I did that. So I guess that's about it. What, uh, okay, and, 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 and we'll, 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 we'll uh, finish uh, up here. I just want, a, I want to show you my, uh, certainly want to, my Jack Eisenhower I'm, jacket. I certainly want to see that. And, and, and the material I was hit with that I took home as souvenirs. What was your question? I was just going to ask, uh, you know, after the war, uh, you came back, uh, went to work for General Electric, married, had children. Western, Western Electric. Western Electric, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and I became a supervisor after about. 10 years and then I worked 10 years as a supervisor and then, then I got caught in a down sweep of, yeah, of yeah. people and uh, I had to give up my supervisor but but I, I had a, I had a grade that was ungraded that was almost as good the pay was just as good and I just didn't have the responsibility yes, yeah. so that was good. And married and uh, had children? Oh yeah married and had three children. And, uh, the thing of it is and when I got married in 47, uh, before then I had, I had gone through and, and gotten a, a pension from, from the government for my war wounds. And they never knew I got married and I never thought to tell them. And so they never knew I had three kids. And just recently I went in and I told them, it's been about 50 years, I'd like you to reevaluate my pension, see if I shouldn't be getting more, perhaps. And uh, they ended up, they, they increased mine by almost 100% on my pension and, and they, they said because I'm married and, and got a wife now, they, they give me $63 a month for her as, as part of the allowance. And that never takes into uh, consideration the fact that we had three kids between us. I would have had more dependents if I knew enough to oh, ask yeah. them before. Yeah. And, uh, Reevaluate my pension, you know, wow. but but they, they they were fair. They dated it back to the time of my request, uh, and they they gave me uh, retroactive money. Oh, on good. It. Okay. So I I thought well used. Well, in in closing, really, uh, uh, one question I like to always ask. Uh, well, two questions. One was uh, how do you feel like that the war changed you. Uh, I know you said that uh, you went in to prove something to yourself. Hopefully, you did it, that. It, it and gave, what else? It, it gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah. Some confidence, and and I felt anything I turned my mind to, I, I could do yeah. uh, as well as the next guy. And uh, I, I think it served me in good stead from that angle. Yeah. What uh, in closing is there anything that? Uh, I didn't bring up that you'd like to talk about, or do you have a closing comment or a thought that you'd like to end the interview with? No, uh, no. I, 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 the only thing I want to say is, I think uh, in the fact that I was taken from Havel at, at an early age and I saw something of the world, uh, I, I, I feel indebted to the service. Well, I, I think it should be the way around. I think we should as a nation be indebted to you. Well, I certainly thank you for your service. So, yeah. Thank well, you. Thank you for the interview. Uh, I'm and sorry. once again, thank you very much for your, your service. I'm sorry I got a little emotional. Yeah, but, you know, I think of these fellows that we, we lost. Yeah. Well, it's understandable, sir. Yeah. Very okay. Okay, why don't we uh, shut off, uh, we'll get the camera, and I'd like to take a look at your, your jacket. Okay, I'll, I'll get on my eyes now, Jack. We wore, wore an, e an eagle patch on the left shoulder, and this, this is the uh, rank I held in the, in the service, technician fifth grade, they call it. This, this is the Army uh, Rifleman Combat by a badge, and this is the Purple Heart with the cross that I earned. And this is the European Theater of Operation. It has some stars in there for the stars we see. A lot of these awards, like this here, Belgian Fours here, that was a division award, so I get to wear it. And, and uh, these stars in here, it's for the European Theater of Operation. And 
combat that we saw, but I didn't see all the combat. I only saw Normandy and Holland. Of course, there's very few in the division that saw all of them. And up top here is a, a parachute wings with two stars on it, which indicate we had two combat jumps. I had two combat jumps. And that's all the division had anyway. So that's about it. Now this this is the, they call it, uh, I forget what we call it, a ruptured goose or something like that. It, everybody that was discharged got one of the ruptured duck. Uh, and they got one of these and they, they wouldn't take any money from us when we went to travel to go home. We were in this patch. Or, or like I went down south and visited a girlfriend I had in North Carolina. And uh, I, I didn't pay anything. I stopped to see my sister in Bethesda, Maryland at the time. This uh, must be a presidential citation with a cluster because we got it for Normandy and we got it for, for uh, uh, Fast Stone, Belgium. That, that's what the, this Belgian Fourier was from. From the division being a fast home Belgium. Part of your body, Bernie, right? Oh, there. yeah. So yeah. this is another button. <laughs> These are two pieces of shrapnel, and I had them in my hand for the, for the, for the filming. These two pieces of the shrapnel that was in my body, the smaller one in my left knee, and the larger piece broke my right shoulder, a clavicle bone. Mm. And, and this. This was the explosive bullet that was they took out from my left armpit. And an interesting thing on any of these, if you if you were to look at it under a magnifying glass, you can still see the underwear I was wearing and the, the blood-stained clothing that was taken from. That would be dark. When it entered my body. And I didn't uh, record. This is your purple heart here. Yeah, this is the Purple Heart, uh, the metal itself. Okay. And one of these is a good conduct. Uh, I'm not a good conduct, but uh, that, that might be good conduct. And the other one is Bronze Star, or one is Bronze Star. I get mixed up which is which. But the Bronze Star is something like the Purple Heart. But again, it was a divisional award. So it wasn't for me as an individual. It was for the division. The combat outfit that we wore into combat, and it has baggy pockets. The Germans had a name for this outfit. It, they, they called us the Devils in Baggy Pants because it had baggy pockets on the side that we carried munitions in. And, and what? Uh, I, I, I evidently had my picture taken in this uh, as opposed to my Eisenhower jacket. How old were you in this picture? Oh, I must have been about 20 years old. It was before I went overseas, so it was, I, I was not 19 or 20. Give this picture to me. Uh, this is our dress uniform. It has an Eisenhower jacket with all the insignia I'm entitled to wear. And uh, I the insignia today shows a little more because it's a culmination of all my time in the service. So it shows stars on the parachute wings to show I had two combat jumps. And uh, shows a purple heart with, with one cluster. There's no purple heart there. So this must have been taken right after my basic training before I went overseas. 